following presentation is for educational purposes only. All of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja Trader website. All right, we are back, everybody. Um, we have with us today a very special guest and uh, Craig Buick from the CME Group. Craig, we're going to talk about the CME Group Market of the Week. How are you? Good, Jim. I'm excited for your uh, for your new format. I'm glad. I'm glad we are too. It's uh, you know, it's the the guys at Mission Control really did a great job of helping us get it together, and uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. Um, but it's early. It's only this is really the first official day. I mean, Friday we did we launched it right. It was kind of we were all thinking, all right, this is going to be like a a beta. There's going to be all sorts of stuff that goes wrong here, but it did it. Everything went pretty smoothly, and so uh, second day we're here. That's great. Going smooth so far? So far, so so far, uh, so good. Um, how are you doing over there? You're at headquarters, right? Right right now? I am. Uh, in fact, if I move, can you uh, can we can you see the green river? Oh, kind of. Yeah. Can yeah. You see? Yeah. The, yeah. The river's green. So just maybe try to make you a little nostalgic for Chicago. Yeah, well, you, no, I'm not nostalgic. <laughs> That's probably uh, good because there's also snowflakes falling into the Green River. So, yeah, yeah, but it's quite a tradition, right? It's quite a. It still did it still bring tons of people downtown. I heard it was a zoo. We uh, we were following the Des Moines Buccaneers around Wisconsin this weekend, so we missed it. But I heard the city was crazy on Saturday. Yeah, we used to take the L train down from Mo Park when we were in high school. And try to uh, you know sneak in somewhere with service a green beer. Well, I think the comment we saw. So my son, we were watching him play hockey, and after the game, uh, he was saying that every single kid that he knew back in Chicago was in the city um, for for that. He's technically a senior in high school, so yep, it hasn't changed much since we were in school. There you go. There you go. Oh, in any event, Craig, I want to pull up. Let's talk about gold futures. Gold futures have been around for a long period of time. Um, they're traded at the CME. I have uh, through Globex. I have a daily chart up right here. I, hopefully you can see it. I know it might be kind of hard for you to see, but um, we had a huge, huge, huge rally um, starting on, I don't know, what is this, on the 29th, end of, end of February. And it was, uh, we hit all-time highs. I mean, not re in real terms, but nominal terms, right? And yep. um, now we're retracing slightly back down. What happened there? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think what's really interesting, and, and Eric's talked about this a little bit, is we saw a gold rally at the end of last year, right? And, and I think that made a lot of sense to a lot of people because we were seeing rates, you know, we, we had these expectations that the Fed was going to make all these cuts and, um and generally speaking, you know, gold is a non-interest bearing asset. So as rates rise, it's usually a little bit of um, kind of a headwind for gold, right? Because you don't earn interest on gold and things like that. So at the end of last year, um, with with an expectation of, of declining rates, and we saw that rally, I think it made sense. And then, but what's, I think, you know, what's impressing people about this rally to which you just referred is that it's it's happening in in a, in an in a, an environment of, of high interest rates. And, you know, some of those interest rate cut expectations, I think have been tempered lately. Uh, we saw a pretty big treasury yield rally um, over the last week or so. Um, and, and yet gold is still doing this. And so it, it's, it's kind of an interesting move, um, you know, that yeah, I think has, has raised people's eyebrows. Well, yeah, it took me off guard a little bit. Um, cause, you know, in my history, in my, you know, I don't know if I'd use the word dotage, probably should, but in the long term I've been around, um, it, gold's always had a hard time maintaining itself above 2000, right? Now I know, I know as we go forward here, you get 
um, uh, gold priced in real dollars and that changes everything. But just in my head, conceptually, it's like over 2000, it can't stay there, but it looks like it's here to stay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm not here to talk about whether it's here to stay or not, but it, it is, you know, it is showing some strength in, in an environment where, you know, maybe you wouldn't have expected it. And, um, you know, I, I had actually earlier this morning, I, I'd sent you that commitment of traders report as well, yeah. which showed that, you know, those funds really gotten long, long gold. And, um, you know, which again, doesn't mean it's going to stay here or anything, but it's another fact that, you know, that managed fund sector of that commitment of traders. And you, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about what that, that report is, um, does show just an, a, a pretty rapid increase in, in long positions, um, from that managed money sector. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to pull that up today, but you know, we look at those commitment trade reports every, every, uh, I look at them Sunday night before I go to bed. Um, so they, it, there's totally, it's, it's congruent here, right? It makes sense. Yeah. And it's, you know, for those, for somebody that doesn't know, it's, you know, it's essentially, um, uh, large open interest holders are required to report their position to the CFTC on a weekly basis. And so you can kind of get a sense for what, what the different customer segments or how they're positioned, I guess, in the futures market. And that's the report to, that, that we're referring to. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying, I'm literally trying to pull it up here. Hang on. I'm going to get it up in a second. I'm fighting my <laughs> way through. I'm fighting my way through this here. I sent you a couple different emails. Oh yeah, see, that's why I got I have a gold silver pick thing up here. All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move on. This particular all right, so let's just talk about the basics though, right? We have this is the classic gold contract, right? This is the big one. It's ten dollars a tick. It's a hundred troy a hundred troy ounces, is that right? Yep. Yep. And and so no the notional value here of one contract, you would multiply the price times that hundred, right? So you would get uh, $210,000 notional value on one contract. Is my math about right? That's exactly right. So it's a fair, the, what we might call the standard gold or the GC is a fairly large contract, right? Because essentially if you were long or short one futures contract, you've essentially gained exposure to over $200,000 worth of gold or put another way, if if you're let's say if you're a long one contract and the price goes up by one dollar, that's a one hundred dollar move in your PL. So, you know, I think you know that can give you a sense of of kind of it's it's a fairly large contract for some individuals. Oh yeah, no, for sure. But but the good news is <laughs> the good news is there's the micro gold, right? And that's one tenth the size. Exactly. So instead of over 200, you're talking about some, somewhere around $20,000. So if you're long one micro and the price moves by $1 per ounce, that's a $10 move to the PL, which is a little bit more manageable or maybe a lot more manageable for a lot of, of individual traders. But it also gives you a lot of flexibility, right? That the standard might not, right? Because you may want to do six of them or four of them, you know, which, you know, obviously the, the math is, is pretty linear. If, if you're long four micros, it's essentially four tenths of one standard. Um, well, and then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you just mentioned uh, that, you know, the $10 instead of the hundred, the, you know, 10, on, 10 troy ounces instead of hundred, right? So you, notional value of 21,000 uh, is still a lot of leverage. It's still a big position, right? But what you could do in those in this environment, to, it, you know, let's say you have an account size of I don't know, I'll just make it up, ten thousand dollars. Maybe your maybe your trading strategy could be different with the micros. Maybe you have more flexibility to scale into positions and scale out of positions and cost cost average dollar and all of those other types of uh, strategies that you probably wouldn't. You might be a little bit hesitant to do in a larger size contract. I think that's exactly right, and that that concept of scaling is something that we've talked about a lot with the introduction of micros. And by the way, the gold micro has actually been around since before we launched the micros on the S and P, the NASDAQ, the Russell and the Dow. Um, and, and it actually was a, was a decent contract, but it's just one that we didn't talk about a lot um, until we saw the success with those micro equity indices. And then it kind of raised the awareness of all these different micros 
including gold. So it's actually been around for a long time. But anyway, but you're absolutely right that that concept of scaling of, of being able to let's let's say you want to build into a, a long position, or you want to sort of take a posi position off slowly. These things really allow you to do that, right? Because you might have the risk tolerance that allows you to be long one full standard GC, but you want to take maybe you want to take that off in pieces, right? Maybe you're long ten micros, then you want to sell three but leave seven of them on, for example. Um, and these things, I think, provide that flexibility and that customization uh, to do that. No, ab absolutely. I'm a super fan of the micros, and and in gold is a great application of those. So I'm all for it. Um, so just kind of let's talk about analysis a little bit. I have, um, I did read, and actually before you sent your email to me this morning, I did read Eric Norland's article. I think you wrote a couple weeks ago about comparing the S and P. Uh, performance to gold's performance over the last, you know, uh, 100 years. 100 years. <laughs> right. Only Eric. And, and again, Eric Norland got, you just, he just got a promotion, right? He's now chief economist of the CME group. Yeah. And he's, he's great. And I, I thought that, you know, we, we had talked about doing this on, on Friday, doing gold. And, and so I found that over the weekend and I thought it was, it was timely. And I think it's very relevant um, to kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah, no, for sure. I'll just pull the art. I'm going to pull this uh, into the in the window. Yeah, I think a couple of those but, graphs are interesting too, where you know, he, he divides the, well, that one right off the bat, right? Right. So his whole paper here is about, um, let's price the S&P 500 in terms of gold instead of U.S. dollars. That's exactly right. Now, this graph, I think, is more of... Um, just kind of shows you this one was was more of an overarching graph, right? To show yeah. that, you know, since we went off of the uh, since we, you know, well, you can see that that straight yeah, line, yeah, yeah. right? So Where right, we that straight line that's dollar. yeah, Brenton Brenton, Brenton Woods, we ended it in 72, Nixon administration. And so it's no it was no longer fixed. No longer fixed to the dollar, right? So that, that <laughs> thank you for saying it more elo eloquently than I was, Jim. But um, but yeah, you can see that, you know, from then because you hear a lot about, um, you know, your 401k and just put it in stocks and that old, that old investing mindset. Well, you know, this graph does a pretty good job of illustrating that for the most part, gold has kind of held its own against the S&P 500 in terms of, of sort of that price appreciation. Yeah, no, for sure. And that kind of surprised me uh, as well um, when, when I saw this and listened to his, Eric's kind of Overview and later on in the article, he also compares it to not only to the U.S. dollar but to other currencies as well. Um, so, uh, and then again, here's his gold ratio logs. Uh, super, super interesting chart, um, and he highlights actually events that happened, right? Like, um, you know, what the era brought us. You know, oil shocks, Vietnam, Greenspan put all of that stuff yeah. to kind of put it in perspective and how it changes. Yeah, I, I, this is the one I thought was really interesting, right? He's basically taking taking the price of the S&P and divided it by gold such that if the line is upwards sloping in this graph, it means that go, uh, the S&P is appreciating relative to gold. And if it's declining, obviously, then gold is appreciating relative to the S&P. And it, it's really interesting to see that, you know, in, in times of, of economic, um, you know, strong economic times and, 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 and less volatility, as you might expect, the S and P appreciates relative to gold. But then, when we get these times of of high interest rates, or or I'm sorry, of of sort of economic distress or geopolitical tensions, we see gold really accelerate versus the S and P 500. And you know, and maybe that's kind of what's happening now, right? Because you know, we 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 started the conversation by talking about the fact that gold had this is, is having this rally even in the face of high interest rates and high interest rate expectations, but there's also a lot of geopolitical uncertainty right now in the world, yeah. you know, in kind of every corner of the world, right? So, you know, a couple of different things that we didn't touch on is, you know, gold has been looked at in history as, as not only um, an inflation hedge, but a store of value, right? And, and, and maybe it's that store of value. And, and again, I'm, you know, we're speculating here, um, but we do, we are seeing this rally um, while we're also seeing, you know, and, and you can talk about it, but a lot of geopolitical uncertainty in, in different, different quarters of the, of the planet right now. Yeah. And I read there's, there's something like a huge percentage of countries 
in the world are having elections this year, like presidential executive elections this year. I want to say 40 percent, a big, big number. Right. And so, again, that's that's going to contribute as well as candidates position themselves and maybe new regimes take over, um, change policies and all that stuff. So it's not just the U.S. where there's an election, but a lot of other places. Yeah. And, and I mean, let, you know, in the name of, of diplomacy, I'll use the word interesting. But, you know, this is, could be the most interesting <laughs> election that we've ever seen in this country, I think. Um you know, so obviously that that comes with the possibility of some some market volatility as well. Yeah, I don't know. I think I, I don't I don't, I agree and disagree with the interesting part. I mean, I think all um, a lot we've had a lot of interesting presidential elections in the history of the U.S. Fair so this is another one. But uh, yeah. <laughs> So we'll see Fair how enough. that goes. But yeah, that was it. So anybody wants to read this article, you're just going to simply go to um, just go to the CME group and look for Eric Norlin. Right. Eric Norlin. And he'll uh, uh, you'll find this article. It's a pretty good article. Oh, the other goodness. thing we didn't talk about. I'm sorry. The other thing we didn't talk about with, you know, we, we talked about the standard and the micro futures. But the other thing with the futures, too, and you, you talked about account size. Well, as with all futures, you 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 don't put up all of that twenty thousand or all of that two hundred thousand uh, of exposure that you're getting, right? We have you know futures have what we call capital efficiencies, which is another word for inherent leverage, which you know to be fair is a double edged sword because it makes you manage your risk, but you don't have to put up that full um, twenty or two hundred thousand depending on whether you're trading a standard or a micro. Right. Right. Exactly right. Exactly right. But let me going back to the conversation about um, stress um, in the economy, uncertainty in the economy. We have a new player now. We have we also have Bitcoin uh, that, you know, is is accumulating investment money. Right. And. You know, when you see Bitcoin railing like it was railing, you see gold railing like it was railing, and then you see equities railing all three at the same time. <laughs> you got to scratch your head and say, Where, "Where's all this money coming from?" And you know, is Bitcoin truly a competitor to these other uh, assets? Well, that, that's a really interesting question, and you're right. We're seeing all these risk assets rally. Or maybe gold is a risk asset or not, but but certainly the Bitcoin and and, and equities. Um, and, and it's an interesting point, Jim, because it wasn't that long ago, kind of before, I think it was more before, you know, the things happened in that space with, with FTX and things. And then they called it the crypto winner, which we seem to have come out of, right? At least, certainly at least for now. Um, but before that, you heard people talking about, about Bitcoin as a digital gold, right? And, and there were people talking about how Bitcoin was going to replace gold as that store of value and things like that. And, and I, it seems like, and maybe you can opine on it, but it seems like the jury is still out on that because Bitcoin has shown some characteristics of providing that store of value function that we've seen gold provide for decades or centuries. Um, but then at other times it acts differently, you know, and it, it becomes uncorrelated to that. So, you know, it, it seems like the jury's still out on that function of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general. Uh, but, you know, happy to listen to what you think about that. Yeah, you know, I, I put in my mind, right, um, you know, I, you think about passive investing, right? Your 60-40 uh, formula, right? You know, throw it in your 401k, you know, let it ride. Um, and then everything else is an alternative asset, which isn't very accurate, but that's how a lot of people think. Everything else is an alternative. Well, what do you mean by that? You mean copper? Well, yeah. Do you mean... Gold, yeah. You mean Bitcoin? Certainly. So you have these alternative assets that are now competing for attention, and they seem to be supporting themselves, you know, you know, bumping themselves up a little bit, like leaning on each other. So um, it's we'll see if you know, there's going to be a big break or not going to be a big break or who knows. But if we all knew, we'd be, you know, down <laughs> with Mike Burke in Miami Beach, hit drinking a margarita. <laughs> That's right. And, and, you know, I, I think one thing that, that you can say, though, is fact is that, you know, the the SEC obviously uh, blessed the physical ETF, Bitcoin ETF recently. Right. And 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 then you saw some of the names 
the players that came into that space with the ETFs and, you know, the, the big, huge money managers. And, and it, you know, I think in a lot of people's views, that does sort of further legitimize that space as a, as a viable asset class. When, when you see the likes of BlackRock and, and these kinds of companies coming in with the ETFs and things like that. Yeah. Although Vanguard's a holdout still. Good article in the Wall Street Journal on that, by the way. Oh, yeah. I, I did have missed that one. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's, I, one thing, I, now I'm glad I have you, you, you're, you, you captured attention here because I want to, I've been using this tool that you, no, that's the wrong one. Is this the right one? Just the, yeah. I've been using the, um, uh, the Vol to Vol tool you turned me on to not so long ago. And I'm a little bit dangerous with this because I, you know, I'm still <laughs> ex experimental mode, but, I have I have up here um, gold options, right? I have up here gold options, and in seven days this is going to expire, right? So this particular option, and we have this chart here where we have uh, these big blue spikes, which represent call, you know, where all you know where, where mm -hmm. the call volume is, and then we have the, uh, uh, the gold spike, which is the put volume, um, and then you have this kind of uh, vol settle curve here as well. Um, and I have the open interest uh, tab selected, uh, Craig. So walk us through yeah. what we're looking at here. Yeah, one of the things I like about about this chart or this tool is the, the amount of information that it shows in one picture. Um, and, and essentially what it's doing is it's taking, and you just mentioned it, the implied volatility in these gold options, and it show, it's translating that um, into the amount of, of price movement that that implied volatility represents in the futures market. So if you look at those pink, orange, and, and yellow bars across the top, yeah. uh, and on my laptop screen, I can't read the numbers, but, but basically what that's doing is saying within one standard deviation, this is what the options market, again, we don't know what's going to happen, but this is the move that the options market is pricing into the futures. So it's saying, and I can't, what, 40 is that 40 yeah so five? so the two the two biggest the two smallest numbers in the middle uh they both say 40.5 so that's one confidence interval right so it's saying within one confidence interval the options market is saying the price is going to be within 40 points of the at the money in either direction now volatility doesn't talk about direction or anything like that saying within two standard deviations it's going to be 70 to 80 to, you know a little bit of a skew there on the upside and then yeah. Uh, and then the yellow is three standard deviations. So it's saying, you know, that that I'm not going to call it a black swan, but that that three standard deviate. It's unless we have some sort of statistical anomaly, that three standard deviation move, it's going to be within that 120 ish dollars or whatever, whatever it says there. So right there, I think that's 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 good information. And again, this I think this option has seven days left. So um, it's saying within the next seven days, that's what the options market is is pricing in. And then, as you mentioned, in this same graph, it shows you where all of the open contracts lie. So it shows you where that big call open interest is. So, and, and then it shows you the delta value at that open interest. It's kind of lightly faded there on the top. It's a little bit hard to see. Yeah. yeah. But it shows you, you know, is that 25 delta or 24 delta? Something like that. Yeah. So saying these 24 delta calls have a big open interest. And a lot of options traders use that open interest. Again, it doesn't mean the price is going there or it's not, but they use it to know where that open interest is, um, especially as you get closer to expiration. So when I look at this, and uh, you know, I've been listening to the options guys too much, but we think in terms of call walls and dealer and dealer dealer price points or whatever you want to call them, and you know, in my mind, it's like uh, could these act like a magnet, right? And if they do act like a magnet, how hard is it to chew through this price point? So, for instance. We have uh, 5,183 calls at 220, right? We're, we're trading, you know, less than that. Um, mm -hmm. Puts are only 210. So there's a there's a lot there's a is there a call wall here per se per se? In other words, yeah, it could attract price, but it's going to be really hard to get past that. Right, and certainly I'm not here to say that it is or it's not. But 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 as I said though, a lot of options traders do use those those large open interest strikes as a, you know, just another thing that they consider and not just options traders, right? And that's kind of what I like about options is even if you're not trading options, you can use the options market to get a lot of information about what it's saying about the futures market and the futures price. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I see a lot of blue. I see a lot of blue, a lot of calls. Um, and, and what and is this? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Jim. No, 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 no. Before I ask my next question, what were you going to say? Well, sorry, if you're sticking on this tool, let's do that. And then, I, and then I'll plug uh, a different okay. tool that we have. So this vol settle, this red dotted line, what does that mean? So that's just your implied volatility curve, right? So, and that's, you know, and again, you, you kind of get into some options math pretty quickly, but in a lot of, in a lot of options markets, you're going to see, it's called the volatility smile, right? So you'll see implied volatility kind of rise at what they call the wings maybe. So as you get out of the money, uh, the upside yeah. call calls and the downside puts, you'll see implied volatility rise. So that's a pretty normal looking implied volatility curve um, that you're going to see, not in every market, but in a lot of options markets, that's what it's going to look like. Got it. Makes total sense. All right. Yeah. But so I've been looking at this every day. I'm getting smarter and smarter. They even have an, uh, you guys even have a, a change, an open interest change, which I'm assuming is the change from yesterday, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I think, you know, that's another interesting one because it tells you what happened. Like, are people getting longer these puts or, sh or, or are they, li you know, liquidating them or, you know, so it tells you what's happening with the position. So it, it's, it's, I think it's a great tool. It's a ton of information in one place. Yeah, for sure. For the, sure. the one thing I will point out, though, is that we have an we have an entire we have our own volatility index called CVOL, and okay. if you search CME Group CVOL, that's C V O L, you get a, a suite of tools that can provide this kind of information and more. Um, it's really a slick uh, a slick place to go to to find uh, options volatility information. All right, so you're co you're complicating my life right now by. By adding but, more information. But once learn you about. learn it, though, you're going to have yeah. this wealth of information at your fingertips. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this is the dashboard down here. Yep. That's exactly right. And you can click into that and it'll take you in a million different places. A lot of historical data, um, but some really cool stuff in there. Okay. So again, just to get back get to the goal. Get into SKUs and convexity and, and all sorts of fun stuff we can talk about. Mm, okay. Well, we're going to save, we're going to table that conversation <laughs> for next time. You know, I, as, as futures traders, particularly uh, day traders and short-term swing traders um, are, are concerned, you know, we want to look, we want to consider what the price potential is that day, right? We, we want to consider what the price potential is that day so that we could develop our bias as so when we get into a trade, we're consistent with our bias. We want to be long right now. We'd want to be short. Where's the possibilities that where price can go based on what uh, other participants in the options market think? Does yeah, sense? and I, I think that's very reasonable. Awesome. Well, we've been, we've been know, using, yeah, yeah. we've been, yeah. Yeah, I think you can use the options market for that because it is the market, right? It doesn't mean it's going to go there and it doesn't mean it's going to stay within that price range, but that's what the options market is pricing is. You know, it, I, I kind of look, it's not somebody's opinion, right? It is the market. It's what the options, yeah. it's what the options market is pricing. And that's why I think it's it's a pretty powerful thing to, to kind of keep an eye on. That's funny you should say that. I, I had, uh, I, Jimmy Ioria the other day used, not a couple of months ago, used the word correction. Markets, you know, we, we have, we're having a correction. And I got, a, I, that sets my hair on fire. The market's never incorrect. It's never, it was it incorrect before? It was never it's wrong. It's never, it, right? Buyers and sellers decided, especially in the futures market, you know, in your markets, buyers and sellers pretty much decide the price. Yeah, right. I mean, and that's, you know, and I think that's the beauty of it is it's, you know, you can listen to Chairman Powell talk about his, the rate cuts or not, lack of rate cuts. Then you look at the Fed funds tool and it's what the market is actually saying. And they're not always consistent with one another, you know, Oh, they're out of sync all the time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's, 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 it's an interesting dynamic for sure. For sure. Well, this was our Craig, thanks for being here with us today. This was our, uh, our, our maiden launch really of CME group market of the week. I can't wait to see what next market's going to next week's going to bring in terms of markets we're going to cover. I also want to just do a shout out to anybody who wants to send us an email at learn L E A R N at ninjatrader.com and say, Hey, I want Craig to talk about this next week and we'll get it in the hopper. We'd be happy to try to accommodate uh, viewers and what they want to see. So Craig, thanks for being here with me. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. It's been fun. All right, everybody, we'll take a quick break and Traders Workshop is up next with Alex Cole. So hang tight.
of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja Trader website.